The Clear Light of Day, Part 7. We begin Chapter 3. Jabez moved about his kitchen slowly and stiffly in the half light of the dawn. It was just after half past five and he felt weary still. He hadn't slept well. He had added some dry kindling to the dying remains of yesterday's fire in the Rayburn's firebox, seen it crackle and blaze up nicely, pushed some chunkier bits on top, filled the kettle and set it on the hottest place of the stove's hot plate. He turned his back on it and leaned against the dish towel rail on the front of the stove, glad of the warmth as he listened to the water beginning to stir. He leaned forward and reached for his tobacco tin on the kitchen table and he rolled a cigarette as he waited for the kettle to heat up. The radio muttered quietly in the corner. He fumbled in his pocket for matches and lit the cigarette. He looked at the end of it, glowing ruby in the cold, uncertain light of the morning. And he thought it beautiful, that small red glow. After a while, as he heard the first sounds of the water heating increasing to something more determined, he pushed away from his resting place. By the yard door, he struggled his feet into his Wellington boots and went out of the kitchen across the yard for the faded plastic bucket he mixed the hen food in. The tabby cat appeared at his side winding itself sinuously around his ankles and he bent for a moment to scratch its ears affectionately. The weather had changed, the sunshine had gone and today's northeasterly wind carried a cold, thin rain. In the small wooden shed where, in with various gardening implements and a bale of straw for his nest boxes, Jabez kept the hen food. He scooped some meal into the bucket from the tin mug inside the paper sack and refolded the top with absent-minded, methodical precision of habit. He carried the bucket back to the kitchen, the cat running at his heels, and added half the heated water from the kettle to the meal, setting the kettle back on the hot plate. He took the bucket to the sink, stirring in the water and some scraps left from last night's supper with a spoon that lay on the draining board. And then he carried the steaming mixture out into the yard, shivering in the slanting drizzle borne on the unrelenting wind, up through the orchard to the chicken house, where his brown hens, shut in securely against the visits of the fox, were still fast asleep, but willing to wake up for their breakfast. He propped the hen house door back and scraped their meal into the aged and dented aluminium bowl that lay on the grass there, watched them tumble out of their house in haste to find their food, checked the laying boxes, not expecting and not finding any eggs so early in the day, and turned back down to the yard where he could hear the kettle beginning to whistle in the kitchen. He left the bucket in the shed, kicked off his boots at the kitchen door, grateful to step out of the wind, and went in to make his tea, strong and dark the way he liked it. He sniffed at the milk he found in the fridge and paused reflectively. Sniffed again and after a moment's hesitation resigned himself to pouring some into the stained and chipped mug he had rescued from its fellows on the draining board. 
he poured some into the cat saucer on the floor near the sink. Opening the door of the Rayburn, he added a split log to the fire, closed it up again and adjusted down the draught. Then, tea in one hand, cigarette in the other, Jabez moved in that quiet way of his from the kitchen into his living room, making for the refuge of his fireside chair. Nothing in the grate but last night's ashes still faintly astir. He put down his tea on the hearth. Sitting on the edge of the chair, leaning forward, his left hand rested on his knee and held the glowing cigarette while he picked up the poker in his right hand and riddled the ashes through. He straightened up with a sigh and then sat for a moment with the poker dangling inert in his hand, his face as grey and hopeless as the ashes on the hearth, just still and letting his mind wander until a cough shook him and he grimaced, recalled to the present moment. He laid the poker down and went patient on his hands and knees to lay kindling, rolled the pages of the free local newspaper into firelighters, set a match to begin what was, for him, always a clinging to hope, warmth, life and home, a fire to sit by, gaze into, brood upon. There came a moment between kneeling to contemplate the yellow-orange flames beginning to devour the twists of paper and rising awkwardly back into his chair when something sharp and painful slid obliquely along Jabez Ferrell's soul. A simple blade of acknowledgement. So abysmally lonely. But he turned from it before it became self-pity to the last half inch of his cigarette and the comfort of tea still hot. In his sixth year as a widower and the sixty-ninth year of his life, Jabez kept that economy of movement, inner stillness, of those who prefer to disturb the deep barren ache of living, only as much as must be. It was, he reflected, as he drew on the last of the cigarette and flicked the butt of it into the flames, a luxury really to light two fires, especially now that spring had arrived. Still, the stove had to be kept in to keep the house dry and warm and in readiness for cooking meals and heating dishwater. And this fire to sit by was a small and temporary delight. Just for a moment, the space it took to sit a while and drink a cup of tea before the day began. Primitive, really, he thought. Not much advance on the Stone Age or whenever in human history they had lit fires to keep away the wild beasts and the evil spirits. For here he sat, keeping his own demons at bay, with the comfort of a fire's light, setting something bright and living between himself and the shades mocking his inadequacy, and his entrenched, habitual gnawing of grief. Well, loneliness. Nothing to assuage it. No help for it. But firelight is something of a consolation. 
essentially alive. As he drank his tea, folding his hands around the mug and sitting forward in his chair towards the fire's warmth, Jabez reflected on his conversation with Esme yesterday. The memory embarrassed him. How had he come to give so much of himself away? He regretted his bitterness and his frank contempt of what, after all, was her way of life, the context for most of what she did. I oh, shouldn't have said those things, he murmured, ashamed. He felt the stirring inside him of the bad stuff, the self-reproach and uncertainty, the sense of inadequacy and weakness. What are you supposed to do with it, all that stuff? Where is it supposed to go? After Maeve had died, he had just kept himself to himself, managed it all as best he could, the tearing, eviscerating misery of grief. And now he had grown a flimsy carapace over the first rawness, but hadn't gotten further than that, really. It sufficed for the day to day. But when, as yesterday, he came to talk about any of it, the despair came back as fresh as ever, uncontainable. And what are you supposed to do with it? Jabez sat a moment longer, his face drawn into haggard lines of weary bewilderment, and then, irritated at himself, he shrugged, inspected the quantity of tea left in the mug, knocked back the dregs of it, and got to his feet to begin the day. There was work to be done. The day did not improve, but continued in fitful showers and keen, persistent wind. Through the morning, Esme finished off her Easter sermon and worked through a pile of correspondence. She had one more Holy Week house communion to do, at Gladys Taylor's almhouse, out at Wiles Green. Facing her sickness with dignity, Gladys never complained and greeted Esme on her visits with warmth and kindness. But Esme saw the pinch of fear underlying the set of Gladys's features and heard the resolve of courage that had entered her voice. She called when she could, with cartons of high-calorie, complete nutrient drinks and magazines, and today, for Holy Week, the bread and wine of communion. She stopped briefly at Brockhurst Priory on her way there and bought a bag of six currant buns and a loaf of bread, mindful of the closed shops in the coming public holiday. She took in a bun for Gladys, who would not eat it, she suspected, but might like to be thought of, and maybe would manage a taste. And she was shocked by the deterioration in Gladys's health, a new frailty, and shadows circling her eyes. Let me call the doctor, she said. But Gladys, surprisingly stubborn, refused to disturb her doctor until normal office hours resumed on Tuesday. When she came away from the house, Esme sat in her car for several minutes, feeling upset and adjusting to the evident reality that Gladys would be with them very little longer. As she drove back through the village, she went more slowly and stopped, eventually, 
outside the old police house. I can't go back again, she thought. That's three days running. I, I mustn't. I, I can't. And she slowly took the keys out of the ignition, took the bag of currant buns from the seat beside her and got out of the car. As she followed the muddy path around the cottage, early weeds heavy with rain wetting the legs of her jeans, Esme became aware she was treading very cautiously, silently actually. In one hand she carried the bag from the baker's, a peace offering. She came into the yard. The shed door stood open. Esme stole closer and stood uncertainly in the doorway. Inside, Jabez was crouched over his zinc bath in the middle of the shed, running an inner tube slowly through his hands under the water, checking for a puncture. He did not look round. Apparently he hadn't heard her. His hair was tied back, but she couldn't see his face. Still, his movements were, as always, calm, methodical. He didn't look cross. She stood in the doorway, watching him. After a few moments, you're standing in the light, he said. And she answered softly, contritely, I'm sorry. He looked back at her briefly, an unreadable look, and stood up, holding the dripping inner tube over the water. For standing in the light? That's quite all right. No, Jabez. For trespassing on sore places. For hurting you. He hooked the tube over the handlebar of a bike propped against his workbench and rubbed his hands dry on his trousers. He lifted his hand to his face and with the back of it wiped away the drip that had gathered on the end of his nose. Esme took in the wrinkled, shrunk look to his skin, presently various shades of mauve and blue, except for his nose, which was rather red. Jabez, she said, you look absolutely freezing. I am, he replied, and looking absently around for some mislaid item, he added, and ready for a cup of tea. And suddenly he looked up, looked directly at her, looked her in the eye, which in that moment she realised he rarely did. The bright flash of a glance that reminded her of every wild creature in a hedge whose eyes had ever met hers. Would you like to come in? a cup of tea. On an afternoon of pastoral visits a minister can be awash with tea. No village chapel meeting, not even the church council, can proceed without a cup of tea. Esme had lost count of the cups of tea she had been offered in Wiles Green, Brockhurst Priory, and South Harbour since she came to live there. But here she had the feeling of being offered something most precious and rare. Jabez, she thought, would not give his hospitality lightly. I would love to, she said, and I brought you some buns to say sorry. He was rummaging among the jumble of things pushed against the wall at the back of his workbench 
sandpaper and bits of chalk, oily rags, spanners and old margarine tubs holding assortments of different sized nuts and valves to make peace with me, he said. She did not answer, but watching him, she began to wonder if truly he had lost something or just found the rummaging a refuge from too direct a meeting. And he stopped suddenly, placing his hands on the edge of the workbench, rough, red, cold, chapped hands, resting there in absolute simplicity, stood with his head bent, adding quietly, because there is no need to, ever. And again, that quick glance that shot like dark fire from his soul to hers. You and I, she thought, have known each other for a thousand years. You're right. Nothing could break the peace between us. And then she thought, my goodness, where did that come from? But she said only, thank you. And he withdrew his hands and left his ruse of searching, came out to her and into the yard, switching off the light and pulling the shed door closed behind him. Around the middle of her solar plexus, Esme felt a childish effervescence of excitement. She so wanted to see inside this cottage. As she followed him across the yard, clutching her bag of buns, Esme had the curious sensation of being once more about four years old, eager, inquisitive, excited, happy and alive. He pushed the kitchen door, which stood ajar, fully open, and stood back for her to go in first. She stepped inside, taking in at a glance its smallness and friendly clutter. A paper feed sack printed with the words Layers Mash lay down as a doormat. The saucer for the cat with its rim of congealed yellow milk. The shabby wooden table, two stools and a chair roughly drawn up to it. The wall above it, fitted with shelves to house miscellaneous crockery and grubby jars of oats and rice and pulses and dried fruit and herbs and brown sugar. She looked at the Rayburn that stood against the inner wall, giving off a steady comfort of warmth and a faint smell of wood smoke and ashes and dish towels set on the rail to dry at the front of it. She saw the clothes rack drawn up to the ceiling, a few garments still hanging there, and the various boots left higgledy-piggledy by the door. The deep white ceramic sink with its sturdy old-fashioned taps and wooden draining board, where various pieces of crockery stood propped to drain, and a cracked and grimy bar of workmanlike soap weighted in a saucer near the taps. Everything was functional and comfortable and plain, and for no reason she could identify, it made Esme feel very peaceful, very welcome, and very much at home. I'll just wash my hands, Jabez said, and then I'll make you a cup of tea. He kicked off his boots and went to the sink. Esme sat down on one of the stools at the table and she watched him. The stoop of his shoulders and the long tail of silver hair that hung down his back. The quiet focus of his absorption in washing his hands. Soap, nail brush, thorough rinsing. 
and yet she could feel him aware of her, even though his back was turned. He was done and came across to the stove to rub his hands dry on a dish towel. He did not look at her and she sensed him suddenly shy. He took the kettle of water from the back of the stove, lifted the hinged cover back from the hot plate and set the water to boil. It'll be a while, he started to say, but the door that led from the kitchen into the rest of the house opened and Esme turned her head to find herself looking into the eyes of the old lady who had accosted her outside St Raphael's church on the first day she had visited Wiles Green. So more of our story tomorrow. It's Sunday and we've been at the campfire church this morning. You know that church I thought it would just be for about six weeks. I thought the lockdown would come and be gone and it would all be finished. But this coronavirus seems to have changed everything, our whole way of life. And the campfire church abides. <laughs> if you haven't been to the campfire church, it's on Facebook and you're always welcome. There is another one called just Campfire Church, I believe. Ours is the Campfire Church. And it has a picture of a little wayside chapel as dark is falling. And that's how you know you've gone to the right place. You're always welcome. How's your day been? We've been sorting and chucking out, getting rid of things, going through things. You have to dispose of things responsibly, don't you? Because, well, we don't keep junk at any time, so the things we have to pass on are always good. So they need sorting and photographing and listing so that they go to the right people. It's a bit time consuming. It makes a lot of space, makes the place more peaceful. What have you been doing? Has it been a restful day for you? Or busy? Maybe you've been outside on a long walk. What's the weather like? It's windy here and sunny after heavy rain last night. And we're in high summer here in England. And of course some of you are in midwinter. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our friendship and our fellowship, for the threads and connections of friendships made online. How precious they are, how fruitful, how encouraging. We pray that even though we've never been in the same room together, in our flesh, in our bodies, even so, that your spirit will encircle us and make connections and join us together through the wonderful threads of the web of the internet. Father, I pray for everybody who comes here and listens to these stories that your spirit will rest upon them, that your peace will enter their souls, that you will open their eyes to truth and love, make space in their lives for simplicity. May it be so, Lord Jesus. Amen. 
Well, peace to you. I hope the rest of your day goes well. Nice to see you. See you again soon. Tomorrow, I expect. See you soon.